When you watch a film, you'll notice that while there is usually a main protagonist and a main antagonist, the conflict is more dense than that. Other characters are present in the story to challenge the protagonist in different ways. Creating a simple protagonist versus antagonist story is why many stories end up feeling formulaic, as if the story is just painted by numbers. But there's a better way to flesh out the conflict within your story. Four Corner Opposition Today I'm going to show you how to implement four corner opposition using a film example and a television example. And if you want to fix your feature length screenplay with me, click the link below to discuss working one on one to rewrite your script. Now let's begin. In John Truby's The Anatomy of Story, he introduces a concept called four corner opposition. Truby writes, in average or simple stories, the hero comes into conflict with only one opponent. This standard opposition has the virtue of clarity, but it doesn't let you develop a deep or powerful sequence of conflicts, and it doesn't allow the audience to see a hero acting within a larger society. That last piece is the most interesting part. Truby goes on to say, four corner opposition has the added benefit of representing a complete society in miniature with each character personifying one of the basic pillars of that society. Four Corner Opposition allows the hero to act inside this society. And society is not black and white. There are pros and cons to every single viewpoint. And Four Corner Opposition allows us to view story in this way. So Truby is saying rather than having a protagonist and one opponent, your story is built around a protagonist and three opponents that challenge your hero in different ways. Here's how to create four corner opposition. Take your two competing philosophical viewpoints. Viewpoint one versus viewpoint two. Under each viewpoint, create a positive and a negative, essentially a pro and a con. Now let's fill in the easiest one first. Your protagonist will usually be the pro of viewpoint one. And many times, but not all of the time, your antagonist will be the con of viewpoint two. It will look something like this. Now most writers stop here, but this is where it can become interesting. To fill in the last two points, ask these questions. Under viewpoint one, the con, what are the drawbacks of your protagonist's belief? What's another darker version of this belief that your protagonist hasn't realized. Under viewpoint two, what are the benefits of your antagonist's belief? What are the good elements of this belief that your protagonist will have to deal with as they struggle to figure out what to do? When you fully fill this out, now these characters create a web of thematic conflict in your story. Use this to your advantage in building scenes, sequences, character relationships, and setups and payoffs. This is a unique way to web your story together through a clear understanding of what your characters believe. Now, on to our examples. A very clear example of this is in Whiplash. First, we need to understand the key viewpoints in conflict. Viewpoint 1. Greatness is more valuable than a normal life, no matter the sacrifice. And first, we have our protagonist, Andrew. Andrew is the pro of pushing for greatness over a normal life. He believes in pushing hard no matter the cost. He sees examples like Charlie Parker and wants to push himself like he did. And he wants to find someone who can push him to become his best. Next, we have Fletcher. In this story, our main antagonist agrees with our protagonist. Andrew and Fletcher both believe that pushing hard for greatness is worth it no matter the cost and Fletcher is here to force Andrew to his absolute limit to see if he is truly committed to this viewpoint. Fletcher will show Andrew just how difficult it can be to become great, and Andrew is not prepared for what's coming. On the other side, we have viewpoint two. A normal life is beautiful and worth living. Greatness is not worth it if it means you must suffer greatly. First, we have Andrew's father, Jim. Jim has lived a normal life, and he is content. He hasn't done anything spectacular, but he enjoys his life and wants to see his son happy and healthy. 
happiness and health are more important than greatness to Jim. However, Jim is the con of viewpoint two because he represents the exact life that Andrew fears inheriting. Jim is neither remarkable nor respected, and Andrew fears living in a way that makes him normal like his father. Andrew wants to be remembered and feels that his father will not be. And finally, we have Andrew's girlfriend, Nicole. Nicole is a normal girl, and she represents a major pro in the normal life Andrew could accept. Nicole is genuinely interested in Andrew, and she shows Andrew how good a normal life could be. Now that we have established these views in conflict, this is where it gets interesting. You can center your four acts around the battles that take place between the key four positions in your story, and you can see the changes in relationships through the acts. Let's go back to Whiplash. Act 1. In the beginning, Andrew is pursuing greatness, yet also holds on to his normal life. The story begins with Andrew. He is a student at a music college trying extremely hard to succeed. And Fletcher is here. He is the intense professor Andrew wants to impress. After Fletcher is introduced, we meet Nicole. Nicole is a cute, normal girl who works at the theater, and Andrew is interested in her. Then we meet Jim, Andrew's very normal father. And as another theater attendee bumps into Jim, Jim is the one who apologizes. Andrew takes his first major leap towards his goal in this act when Fletcher chooses him to be a part of his band. And right after this, we return to Nicole. With his newfound confidence, Andrew asks Nicole out, connecting himself more to a normal life as he also goes further towards his goal. Things look like they're going Andrew's way, but Andrew is not quite prepared for how intense Fletcher really is. This is only the beginning. Now, are you a rusher? Or are you a dragger? Or are you gonna be on my fucking time? I'm gonna be on your time. In act two, Andrew continues to try and reconcile both sides of the dilemma. Andrew practices and practices after being humiliated by Fletcher. Then he goes on his date with Nicole. And here we get a sense of who Nicole is. Andrew really likes her, but she doesn't have the same kind of drive that he has. But like, what do you want to study? I don't know yet. Back with Fletcher. Listen up, cocksuckers! Hurry the fuck up. Andrew moves closer to his goal. When the core drummer loses his sheet music, Andrew steps up to play in the band in a competition. And Andrew gets what he wants. He becomes the band's drummer. Tanner, what are you doing? It's core only today. I don't have time for alternates. After this, we return to Jim and by extension, Jim and Andrew's family. Jim gets made fun of by his family, and no one understands what Andrew is doing with his drumming. Neither Andrew nor his father are respected by the rest of their family. But now that Andrew is tasting success, he decides to stand up for himself. So that's your idea of success, huh? I think being the greatest musician of the 20th century is anybody's idea of success. However, Jim counters him. Dying broke and drunk and full of heroin at the age of 34 is not exactly my idea of success. Andrew and Jim's views are becoming more and more distant now that Andrew is succeeding. In Act 3, Andrew is pushed to his absolute limits. Fletcher takes away Andrew's core position, and now he has to double down even harder to get what he wants. And now it comes at the cost of his relationship with Nicole. I want to be one of the greats. And I would stop you from doing that? Yeah. Andrew is now cutting off his connection to a normal life so that he can succeed under Fletcher. And Fletcher brutalizes him, but he earns his core position back. However, at the competition, things go wrong. Andrew misplaces his sticks, and Fletcher says he's going to give his spot away. By the time you're done at Schaefer, you're gonna make Daddy look like a fucking success story. But Andrew fights back. He's going to play, but he pushes himself too far and pays the price. Andrew is kicked from the band and expelled from Schaefer. Fletcher destroys Andrew's dream. And in Act 4, after spending some time in a normal life, 
Andrew is reinvigorated and achieves the greatness he is looking for. Andrew now returns to Jim's world. Jim pushes for Andrew to use the car accident to get Fletcher fired from Schaefer. Do you think that I would let him put my son through hell and then just walk away scot-free? And Andrew decides to do it. He gets a new apartment, watches movies with Jim, and gets a normal job. But Andrew meets back up with Fletcher, and Fletcher has a moment to explain himself. There are no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. After this speech, Andrew is reinvigorated with his desire to become great, and Fletcher gives him an opportunity to drum in a professional competition. Andrew invites Nicole to come watch his performance, but Nicole has moved on. I was going to check with my boyfriend. And when Andrew goes to the performance, Fletcher reveals the truth. You think I'm fucking stupid? What? I know it was you. He has set Andrew up with the wrong music, and he is going to embarrass him in front of everyone who would be able to make his career. Andrew gets up to leave, and his father, the representation of the normal life, is waiting to embrace him. But then, Andrew chooses to walk back on stage. He takes over, and finally becomes great. Now I've looked at this film on this channel before, but the reason I'm taking a look at it now is because it is a great film to look at in simplifying your story. Rather than having an overabundance of characters, focus on a few characters and how their relationships change over the course of the film. How do the characters move against each other and how does your protagonist's relationships change as they move towards what they want? Now, let's take a look at a TV show and talk about how it's different. Let's go to The Last Kingdom Season 3. Let's take a look at our two viewpoints. Viewpoint 1. It is most important to keep your freedom and follow after your own interests. Our protagonist is Uhtred. Uhtred is our main character. He was born a Saxon, but was taken away by the Danes at a young age. Now he constantly feels in the middle of two worlds the Danish customs, ethics, and religion that he grew up with, and his Saxon blood. Uhtred goes after what he wants first and foremost. He does not fully align with the Saxon way of life, yet he lives among them and fights for them against the Danes. The con of this viewpoint is Ethelwald. Ethelwald is the son of the previous king of Wessex. His uncle, Alfred, has been made king instead of him and he has hated this fact ever since. It gives him a disdain for Alfred and for the way Wessex is currently being run. On the other side, we have viewpoint two. Fulfilling your duty and being loyal to your community is the most important thing. The pro of this view is King Alfred. King Alfred places Wessex and his duty to it above all else. Even as he begins to die, all of his time is focused on making sure Wessex survives. Uhtred is Alfred's sword. Alfred has made sure that Uhtred remains loyal to him, because Uhtred is an extremely valuable leader and warrior. On the con, we have Ragnar. Ragnar is Uhtred's Danish brother. When Uhtred was captured and made part of a Danish family, Ragnar became his closest friend. But Ragnar is completely inside his community and culture. And the most important thing to him is Uhtred coming and joining him as a Dane. Just like in Whiplash, the show centers the core conflict between this web of characters. Now there will be some spoilers here, but I'm not going to go through the entire season. I recommend you give it a watch. In season three, episode one, Uhtred is a Lord of Wessex, Alfred's kingdom. The Danes, including Uhtred's brother Ragnar, are north, waiting for Alfred to die so they can attack Wessex and take it for themselves. And Ethelwald is living under Alfred's rule. Uhtred fights a great battle for Alfred, showing just how valuable Uhtred is for Alfred and for Wessex. This episode sets up the current relationship between our characters, and we are in a state of relatively low conflict as the season's inciting incident has not happened yet. 
But in episode two, all of this changes, when Uhtred kills a priest who is speaking terribly about Uhtred's deceased wife. Alfred now demands Uhtred swear an oath to Alfred's son, but Uhtred is tired of being bound by duty to Alfred's kingdom. I cannot swear an oath I will not keep. You know this, an oath to protect Edward is an oath for the remainder of my life. There is no negotiation to be had, Uhtred. None. Uhtred, feeling he has no other choice, betrays Alfred and escapes Wessex. This creates a massive shift in the world. Uhtred was one of the biggest reasons Alfred's kingdom remained strong. Now with him gone, who knows what's next. Now that he's no longer Alfred's sword, Uhtred goes to his brother Ragnar in the north. You're a Dane for life now. Say it. I am a Dane for life. From this day onwards. This means everything to me. When Uhtred runs to his brother, Ethelwald takes this as an opportunity to build an alliance against Alfred, believing he might be able to take his throne back. Ethelwald betrays his people for his own personal gain and goes to the Danes to make an alliance with them. This action by Uhtred affects every single character in the show, and now each of them act according to their own desires. Alfred must save his country without Uhtred. Ragnar will now attack Alfred and attack hard, and with the help of Ethelwald. In episode 3, with Uhtred gone from Wessex, the Danes, including Ragnar, want to take Wessex. Uhtred now feels trapped in the middle, between his desire not to live under Alfred's rule, but at the same time, not wanting to see Wessex fall to the Danes. Two Danish warriors, Bloodhair and Heston, show up to join Ragnar. They are ready for a war with Wessex, and as they enter, Uhtred notices that Ethelflaed is with them. Uhtred despises Ethelflaed, but Ethelflaed believes they are the same. You do not belong here. My crown was stolen, and thanks to you, I now have the opportunity to take it back. Make no mistake, we are the same, you and I. We are not the same, and never shall be. Both men are serving their own purposes, but Uhtred believes he is still honorable, while Ethelflaed is not. Uhtred does not want to attack Alfred, but Ragnar tells him that his actions have caused everything to change. You have made this possible by abandoning Alfred, by leaving Wessex. You have made this possible. And sure enough, the Danes decide to attack Wessex. But Uhtred cannot be a part of the destruction of Wessex. Even though he is no longer Alfred's man, he loves Wessex and the people there. So Uhtred abandons his brother. Then choose. Do you stand with us? With each of us? Or not? I will be leaving. Now Uhtred is in full conflict with every single pivotal character. How does this resolve? Watch the show yourself and keep a close eye on how this major dynamic shapes the show. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. In a TV show, and also in some more dense films like The Godfather, each main character is surrounded by their own smaller character webs. Think of it like this. Just like a story circle can be used for an entire screenplay, acts, and scenes, you can have smaller character webs inside of larger webs. And many TV shows do this best. Let's return to The Last Kingdom to explain. Uhtred wants to be free and to follow his own path, and each of his men have their own views on how that path should be followed. Finnan is an Irishman and Uhtred's right-hand man. He is a warrior like Uhtred, and when Uhtred is banished, he still doesn't believe they should betray Wessex. Citric is a Dane. He represents the part of Uhtred that still holds on to his Danish upbringing. Osfeth is the representation of Christianity in Uhtred's life. He doesn't believe in fighting, and he values his connection to the Christian God. He is also loyal to Wessex, and when Uhtred flees Wessex, he is completely against allying with the Danes to attack Wessex. Alfred also has his own web. He wants to keep Wessex alive, and is entirely devoted to his people and his country. Edward is Alfred's son and heir. 
Alfred's entire legacy rests on his ability to place Edward on the throne of Wessex. But Edward doesn't understand his father's dedication to being king. Queen Aylesworth believes in Alfred's mission, and she wants to do it without Uhtred. She sees Uhtred as a pagan infection in Alfred's kingdom, and she doesn't want Uhtred near Edward. Father Bayoka is the direct tie between Uhtred and King Alfred. He follows Alfred wholeheartedly, but he believes Uhtred is necessary for Wessex's survival, and he knows Uhtred is honorable. Ragnar wants to lead the Danes to glory and take Wessex, as is the Viking way. Brida is Ragnar's woman, and a close childhood friend of Uhtred's. She supports Ragnar fully, and wants to see Uhtred and Ragnar come together. Knut is Ragnar's cousin, and he has ambition. He wants Ragnar's place at the front of the army, and he wants Brida. He drips poison in the ears of Ethelwald and Brida to create division and take Ragnar down. Bloodhair and Heston both are allies and potential enemies to Ragnar. Ragnar is surrounded by men who are half loyal and half looking for their own chance to lead. Ethelwald wants to become King of Wessex by any means necessary even if it means allying with the Danes and betraying his community. Ethelwold makes an alliance with Heston and Bloodhair as he tries to take Alfred's throne, but they see him as nothing more than a joke and a traitor. His most important ally becomes Canute. Both Ethelwold and Canute believe Ragnar is not fit to lead, and both of them are willing to do what it takes to undermine Ragnar. The denser your character web, the denser your plot and the easier it is to see the conflicts between your characters. You can essentially build an entire society by simply giving each main character a small group of characters that challenge them in specific ways. Now let's review. Remember that great storytelling isn't just conflict between characters. It's a conflict between characters and their values. You want to build four distinct characters, one protagonist and three opponents who represent the key philosophical dilemma of the story in different ways. You build your two viewpoints, viewpoint one and viewpoint two. You then have a pro and a con for each viewpoint. For viewpoint one, the con, ask yourself, what are the drawbacks of your protagonist's belief? What is another darker version of this belief that your protagonist hasn't realized? What is another darker version of this belief that could be used to challenge your protagonist? And on the other side, what are the benefits of your antagonist belief? What are the good elements of this belief that your protagonist will have to deal with as they decide what they believe? And if you're interested in fixing your screenplay with me, click the link below this video to discuss working together one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks for watching.